As I write this, I have the world's worst case of stage fright. After six years and tens of millions of dollars, after break-ins and lawsuits, after marriages and children and divorces and deaths, we're about to ship Half-Life 2. You, the reader, know how the launch of Half-Life 2 went. You've read the reviews, seen the sales figures, heard about awards, or the lack thereof, and best of all, you've played the finished game. We've done none of these. Did we create a worthy successor to Half-Life? Did we live up to gamers' expectations? Did we pull it off? You know, and I don't, and that seems terribly unfair to me right now. This was what Gabe Newell wrote as a foreword to the book Half-Life 2, Raising the Bar. Every time I read it, I'm reminded that there are human beings working at Valve. These same human beings I once idolized for inspiring me to create would also be the same human beings I would grow endlessly frustrated with. I wanted them to return to being the company I know. It's been nearly 13 years since we've been promised another Half-Life game, and in those 13 years, we've received little to no news from the company themselves until the surprise announcement of a VR prequel. As I write this, I empathize heavily with Gabe Newell in the final hours of Half-Life 2's development. I'm writing this on the 21st of March. The game comes out in two days, and I am incredibly anxious. I've never felt this way about a game before. Valve needs to convince the world that they can single-handedly push the medium of virtual reality forward. That their game alone is worth investing in a relatively new and expensive form of entertainment. They have to convince longtime Half-Life fans that this is something they should be experiencing. They need to earn the forgiveness of people like me, after waiting so long for them to say anything that a retired writer had to finish the story for them. But above all else, they need to make a good game. A great game. This may not be the fabled sequel we've dreamt of playing, but expectations are still astronomically high. Valve has been in a bit of a rough patch, and they need to show the world that they're still capable of releasing groundbreaking video games. Those of you watching this video right now know how everything went down. You've read the reviews, and some of you have even played the finished game. With so much to prove, so much to say, and so little time to convince people, will Half-Life Alex actually deliver? In order to understand how we got here, we need to go back to episode 2. We're left on an agonizing cliffhanger with the promise of more to come. Valve envisioned a trilogy of episodic sequels to Half-Life 2, a vision they sought to make a reality. Back then, we had every reason to believe episode 3 was on its way. But it never came out. The game expanded into something too big and too ambitious to be an episodic entry, while also being a project too daunting for them to work on. During these endless experiments, Valve went completely silent on Half-Life. They went from discussing it with optimism to attempting to escape the subject entirely. They wanted to be crisp on what they were working on, but what that meant was that Half-Life fans would end up waiting for a long, long time. Amidst this silence, Gabe Newell stated that they've moved beyond the episodic model, essentially cancelling Episode 3 and leaving the future of the series ambiguous. During this lull, Valve focused outwardly on supporting CSGO and Dota 2, developing various virtual reality experiences with the Lab and SteamVR, and even dabbling in the controversial concept of brain interfacing. For the longest time, this was what the world, myself included, thought Valve had become. Experimenting with the potential future of technology, supporting multiplayer-centric games-as-a-service type stuff, jumping on trends, and raking in cash from Steam. A handful of people misconstrued my attitude towards modern Valve. Yes, I felt scorned and betrayed by their decision-making as a hardcore fan of their work, but my harsh criticisms come from a place of warmth and love. 
It's not that I was fed up with them entirely or doubted their future, it's that I wanted them to prove me wrong. I wanted them to prove the world wrong and come back to life. The Valve we all once knew were thought to be dead, but in truth, they were still alive. They just needed some time. Some Valve time, if you will. In March of 2015, Jeet Barnett revealed that Valve had experimented with existing assets in virtual reality, notably Half-Life assets, just to throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. When asked about a potential Half-Life game within that medium, Jeet Barnett responded, We're not saying no, but we don't know what the right thing is. Our most precious resource is time, and we don't have enough time for people to do everything. Would we like to make all of our franchises in VR? Absolutely, but we don't have enough time or people. So we have to figure out what's the best fit, what plays to the strengths of VR. Two things in particular struck me about his response. For one, he didn't say no. Valve loves to keep their options open. Very rarely do they say no to anything. They never actively denied the development of a Half-Life game, despite various writers, designers, artists, and animators leaving the company. They were always open to exploring new possibilities with their IP, stating that it was about picking up the right tool at the right time. If the tool was Half-Life, it would hypothetically be used to solve problems in virtual reality development. Does this mean a potential Half-Life 3 would be in VR? Well, ironically, that was one of the things they said no to. Chet Falasek straight up said no to that during a conference about VR development. Whatever was being worked on behind the scenes wouldn't focus on the continuing adventures of Gordon Freeman. Rather, it would be a self-contained experience within the universe of Half-Life. In my Half-Life retrospective, I mentioned that Valve's desks have wheels, essentially meaning that employees can work on whichever project they feel motivated to pour time into. As time went on, these experiments became rather exciting prospects for a potential game, and paired with the game's hypothetical setting, it drove more and more people to turn this dream into a reality. Just three months after Jeep Barnett's response, we received some tantalizing leaks. Within the Steam VR app Destinations, several lines of code reference something called HLVR, as well as some familiar entities from the Half-Life series. These leaks continued throughout the next four years, even after Valve announced their own virtual reality headset, the Valve Index. During this time, Mark Laidlaw retired from Valve and published what would have been the plot for Half-Life 2 Episode 3. Any hope that I had for a proper conclusion to the Half-Life series died then and there, and it revitalized my undying passion for the series. I wanted Valve to talk. They'd tease their VR games and whatnot, but I just wanted them to say something, anything regarding the status of these games. Not just Half-Life, but Left 4 Dead, Portal, and poor old Team Fortress 2. As of writing this, the game is in desperate need of new content. The community has taken it upon themselves to develop that content, as Valve once again refuses to communicate. Actually, as of recording this, they were forced to comment on a source code leak, and that was their first tweet on the Team Fortress account in months. The last one was during the economic crash that the item market had, so that's what's going on there. Transparency and honesty goes a long way with consumers, I find. Back in January of 2019, Nintendo was brave enough to announce that Metroid Prime 4, one of their most anticipated games, had to restart development from scratch as the game wasn't living up to expectations. With this, the game went home to Retro Studios, and the clock started over. Of course, it hurt to hear this news, but I was empathetic with them because they said something. They were honest. If Valve had said, we're not doing Episode 3 because it's evolved into something greater, or, we can't support Team Fortress 2 forever, so our next update will be the last. My outlook on the company would be completely different. So I've never agreed with Valve's stance on going radio silent until they have something to share. Gabe thinks hearing about the twists and turns would drive people crazy, but the truth is I love hearing about the challenges they face. There's always something to learn, and I feel it can make consumers like me be more understanding of their circumstances. Case in point. Valve held a conference at the DigiPen Institute of Technology last year in order to discuss their flagship VR game. No specific announcements were made, but it shed some light on how difficult developing a game like HLVR proved to be. Kerry Davis managed to talk about VR doors for 30 minutes and still keep me totally enthralled. Something as simple as opening a door in virtual reality actually caused them to jump through a ton of hoops. The end goal was to have the door open and close as the player would expect it to in real life. Something so seamless you wouldn't even take notice of it. Sound familiar? This is exactly what Half-Life 2's physics engine sought to achieve. Valve wanted the game's physics to react realistically and blend into every aspect of its design. What they aimed to achieve with Half-Life 2 was being tackled once more in HLVR, only this time, they were working in an entirely new paradigm. 
Then, on November 18th, 2019, Valve officially announced Half-Life Alex. Three days later, the first trailer was released, and a release window was confirmed. I was sold. I was suddenly optimistic for the future of Valve. I was ready to forgive them for the silence I'd sat in for years, and for all of their questionable missteps. But the rest of the world wasn't entirely swayed. Sure, it showcased some enticing concepts that were only possible in VR, and they unveiled the full capabilities of Source 2, but even those that thought the game showed promise weren't guaranteed to buy a virtual reality headset for it. We all have responsibilities, and some people have tighter budgets than others. And was it really worth buying for a single game? There are a lot of questions with answers that hinged on Half-Life Alex's quality, and this must have stressed the developers out to no end. Will this game convince people of VR's legitimacy for delivering games? Is it worth dropping a good chunk of change on a headset, along with potential PC upgrades? Will developers feel motivated to help VR coexist with traditional game development? Could it usher in a silver age for Valve, focusing solely on VR development? Will it answer age-old questions about the mythical continuation to this story, completely disregard Mark Laidlaw's ideas, or will it do neither and instead act as filler? Will it be a good VR game? Will it be a good Half-Life game? Will it be good? Will it be good? Will it be good? There's so much anxiety involved in shipping a game like this. They probably couldn't stand it, and I found myself thinking about the game more and more as the release date drew closer. I went to bed on March 22nd knowing that the next day, for better or for worse, my world would suddenly be different. March 23rd arrived, and I launched the game. What was its EXE called? HLVR. We'd come full circle, and I was about to play Valve's first single-player game in 9 years. And the first Half-Life game in nearly 13 years. And I only managed to get past the first loading screen before I felt like crying. Here I am at the main menu for the first Half-Life game in a long time. I'm looking up at a combine wall, rubble surrounding me. That logo makes itself known. No music, just ambience and a bleak environment. Show of hands, how many of you remember the first time you opened Half-Life 2? You fade into one of the game's many areas depending on the progress you've made, a brief glimpse into its detailed world. The only sounds to accompany these glimpses are the ambience to each area, and the noises of the menu. A simple title screen for sure, but each area of Half-Life 2 is extensively detailed and enriched by its atmosphere. You fade into City 17 and you get a taste of its oppressive vibe, the CP chatter, and the lasting effects the Resonance Cascade had on the world. You fade into Highway 17 and you're focused on a deserted cliffside cottage amidst the fog, as a combine trade headed to Nova Prospect passes by. As you jump into each area, you know what's to come. It's a mix of action, exploration, and horror. These title screens are the calm before the storm, as you prepare yourself for the road ahead. Whereas you know what to expect with each of these screens as they appear based on progress, Half-Life Alex has 13 years of uncertainty behind it. This wall is the last thing standing between you and what's to come. Now on repeat playthroughs, this wall doesn't maintain that same feeling. And that's okay, because it does have two other things going for it. For one, it's a great tool for getting those new to VR acquainted with scale and three-dimensional depth. But that's not enough. What long-lasting impact does this title screen have? Well, let's take a look at the game's key art. We see Alex about to breach this massive wall that I've been discussing. We're embodying her in this moment, about to do the impossible and take on an army, galactic in scale, all by ourselves. While it's hard to rival how Half-Life 2 handles its title screen, Half-Life Alex takes advantage of virtual reality to convey a message to fans of the series through the eyes of Alex Vance, while simultaneously building upon her character's stubborn and courageous nature. You might think I'm overanalyzing a title screen, but let me tell you, that's par for the course with a game this detailed. I would have made my Half-Life retrospective a dozen hours long, but I paced myself and discussed what mattered most. This time, I'm only talking about one game. The game opens with what I can only interpret as the space in between our reality and the plane in which the G-Man exists. A third-person perspective on the world of Half-Life. We get brief looks into this space in the previous Half-Life games as we're presented with information via text. Physically being in that space feels pretty cool, and in this moment, it builds anticipation for whatever you're about to fade into. I thought I was prepared. And then I read this.
Valve made it no secret that they would address Episode 2's ending in this game. Through direct references in the game's initial trailer to comments from the developers themselves, Half-Life Alex was intended to be more than just a prequel. And that better be the case. I needn't reiterate the fact that a new Half-Life game has taken over a decade to release. But at the same time, we were given closure. At least, the closest we could get to closure. They're boxed in. The community are eager for an official continuation, but altering something that has resonated with so many fans would be unwise. And I think a part of me knew that Valve was fully aware of that. But we'll have to put that on the back burner for now, because I can see City 17, and I'm on the verge of tears once again. I shouldn't have to point this out, but Half-Life Alex is one of the best looking video games I've ever seen. It looks photorealistic on its highest settings. Throughout this franchise, the artists have understood that true, high fidelity visuals in gaming come from art direction. This is why Half-Life 2's graphics have stood the test of time. Obviously, it was a huge leap forward at the time in terms of lighting, geometry, and animation, but the effort that went into its textures and the authenticity visible in its various locales are what really maintain its timelessness. Here, we have 13 years worth of advancements in real-time computer graphics being put to the test in a virtual reality game. A match made in heaven for immersion, and the artists poured their blood, sweat, and tears into replicating and upgrading the convincing look of Half-Life 2's world. Every locale is bathed in detail, and feel convincingly real when looked into. You'll see more of it as we go, but for now, let's focus on the game's intro sequence. Even something like this has a lot to live up to in the context of Half-Life. This series has been able to ease anyone in regardless of experience with first-person shooters. Although Half-Life is one of my favorite video game series, I wouldn't consider it a strong contender for one of the greatest shooters. Its gunplay is satisfying, of course, but it remains tempered in comparison to its adrenaline-fueled contemporaries. And that's for the best, because Half-Life is much more than a first-person shooter. The first game demonstrated this via its iconic tram sequence, as well as its first chapter. I don't want to echo what has already been said about this game's opening, but I'll briefly summarize. This slow-moving tram ride allows you to take in the sights and atmosphere of Black Mesa, as it foreshadows the game's many events and locales. As you enter, you're able to interact with the scientists and guards, investigate the site's history, and discover easter eggs at your leisure. Finding your way to the test chamber eventually means you can work your way back after the Resonance Cascade. All silent tutorials that acquaint you with the game's pace and mechanics. Half-Life 2 similarly guides you through its world and mechanics, while also introducing you to the game's seamlessly integrated physics engine. Slowly but surely. By the time you reach Ravenholm, you'll have acquired the Gravity Gun, and the game lets you go crazy with your newfound resourcefulness using anything and everything as a weapon. Half-Life Alex needed to do something similar in an entirely new medium. It also needed to balance both introducing virtual reality to new players, while also creating an engaging and challenging video game for veterans. A tall order, but Valve has already struck this balance twice before. And with how long they've taken with their virtual reality projects, it's no wonder they'd have a few ideas. This balcony serves as your introduction to the game's mechanics. You're able to feel the weight in various objects, throw things at the people below, play with radio frequencies, have a snack, sorry, consume a water-flavored desiccated sustenance bar. They'll even let you write on the windows with functioning dry erase markers. I can't imagine how hellish it must have been to get this working properly, and yet it serves no purpose gameplay-wise. It's just there because they felt like doing it. This is the Valve I fell in love with. They're back, and I couldn't be happier. There's more conditioning to be done throughout this first chapter, and I'll cover it as we go. Let's get down to brass tacks. It's no secret that a lot of people experience motion sickness when playing games in virtual reality, and Valve needed to take steps to avoid this in the event that this is someone's first experience with the medium. Considering this is a monumental release and the fact that the Valve Index sold out across the world when this game was announced, I'm willing to bet that's the case for a lot of people. Fortunately, Valve's years of experimentation allowed them to figure out what worked best for everyone. The game features two teleportation-based movement types. The most beginner-friendly is the Blink movement type, which uses a brief transition as you warp from place to place. You can also use Shift, which rapidly moves you to the position. If you're not used to VR, this could seem a bit jarring. Like, you're not physically moving, but you're being moved by the game. Thankfully, it is a quick and smooth transition from one place to another, so I feel new players can adjust to it quickly. Good thing too, because it allows you to survey your surroundings throughout the entire process and immediately take cover or fight back if need be. The game was designed around teleportation-based movement, with the player hopping from place to place and surveying immediate surroundings. 
Now in situations where enemies are actively chasing you, this can feel a bit disjointed, and it doesn't help that this kind of movement already felt immersion breaking in the first place. Thankfully, Valve realized this and developed an option for continuous locomotion. This is slowly becoming commonplace in VR shooters, but it unfortunately brings up another earlier issue I mentioned with the disconnect between physical and virtual movement. Although Boneworks laid the groundwork for this kind of movement in the shooter, looking back it was a bit too fast and jittery when sprinting. If Valve were to ease people into this type of movement in order to replace an antiquated teleportation system, they would have to take precautions. With continuous locomotion, Alex moves at a slow, steady pace, and she doesn't have any momentum in her movement. You influence how fast she moves, and she'll come to an immediate halt when you let go of the thumbstick. It maintains immersion without being overtly nauseating, and sets the standard for this kind of movement. Even though the base speed is rather slow, you can use shift movement in tandem with continuous to get from point A to point B much faster, which is useful when you're trekking through areas you've already been or when you find yourself in a precarious situation. This actually becomes necessary for crossing over gaps and whatnot, as the game is still built around this kind of movement. Instances where the game require your character to do some platforming are instead based around teleportation, and there's no jump button of any kind. Valve has taken precautions in making this both an accessible and detailed VR game for sure. With continuous movement, there will be times where you'll find yourself walking off a pile of boxes or a slightly elevated platform, for example. Rather than experiencing a harsh drop that gives you that sinking feeling in your stomach, which is something that happened in games like Boneworks and even VR Chat, Half-Life Alex instead slows you down in your descent until you reach the ground. If you're physically unable to crouch in order to get under obstacles, there are options for height adjustments that you can bind to your controllers. Climbing ladders can either be done physically or skipped entirely depending on how you feel. And last but not least, you can play the entire game with one hand if need be. In retrospect, it's nice to know that years of experimentation have some practical impact on VR game development. In my Half-Life retrospective, I briefly mentioned them making strides in this industry. It's one thing to see them in separate, inconsequential experiments, but it's another thing entirely seeing them at play in a fully-fledged video game. With that said, I have to ask, what makes Half-Life Alex a great VR game? We've seen what it can do to ease new players in, but what does it do for the medium as a whole? Well, for starters, the game revolves around a precursor to the gravity gun. The Gravity Gloves. Oh, sorry, the Ru- yeah, let's call them the Russells. The Russells, as coined by this gentleman here, who may or may not be named Russell, allow you to yank things towards you with a simple flick of the wrist. Once it's close enough, you can grab it out of the air. Once this clicks, it feels amazing. <laughs> this evolves on the force grab concept a few VR games have used before. It allows the player to remain in their play space, their little zone of comfort, and take advantage of their surrounding environment. The only problem? I mean, how involved is pointing at something and then squeezing your hand to bring it towards you? With the Russells, you still have to factor in the weight of an object, what's on top of it or around it, and whether or not you can catch the damn thing. Of course, later in the game you'll be flinging resources towards you as it becomes second nature, but that's not the only thing the Russells are good for. You can steal grenades and other resources off of enemies as they live and breathe, and you can even yank a live grenade out of the air and throw it back. This is something that you could do in Half-Life 2 if you had quick reflexes with the gravity gun, but it wasn't necessary. Gordon was light on his feet and he had a plethora of ways to deal with enemies. As we've established, most VR games benefit from keeping the player in a single physical environment, and being flushed out of cover can and will leave you naked and afraid, so you're actively encouraged to fling that shit right back at him. There's even an achievement for it. Look, I know in concept the Russells seem simple, and it might feel a bit absurd to waffle on about them for ages, but that's just it. A simple idea has completely reinvented how you can interact with the game. This is not unlike Half-Life. For example, Half-Life 2 created an intricate physics engine and someone dared to ask, what if we let people play with this? It took a lot of work to get to that point, as I'm sure it did with Half-Life Alex, but it started with a simple idea. And that, in essence, is what Half-Life has always been about. It's simple in execution, and it goes out of its way to be linear, but it has more detail than most shooters released in the past 20 years. Of course, at its core, Half-Life will forever be defined as a first-person shooter. There's no getting around that. How does Half-Life Alex handle its gunplay? Shooters are perhaps one of the most common virtual reality genres, so the groundwork has already been laid out. If you don't already know, VR shooters are in a unique position amongst the FPS genre. Clicking on heads has suddenly become a game of physical accuracy, distance measurement, and range. Reloading is also a test of reflexes, rather than hitting a button and waiting for an animation to finish. Shooters have the potential to feel much more complex in virtual reality, but that doesn't mean they should feel complicated. Players shouldn't consistently struggle to comprehend the functions of a weapon. 
they should be able to reload and operate it within seconds of fiddling. Getting into Pavlov VR isn't easy for new players, as they have to wrap their head around dozens of weapons and their unique functions. In that regard, Half-Life Alex is the exact opposite. It only has three weapons, but they're all easy to understand. Although it might seem like a huge bummer for a Half-Life game to only have three weapons, there is a purpose for this limited selection, and we'll talk about that soon. You start off with a pistol, but you acquire a shotgun and an SMG over the course of your journey. The pistol functions how you'd expect, and it streamlines certain concepts from other VR shooters. Need to reload? All you need to do is press a button to eject the empty magazine, grab a full mag from out of your backpack, load it, and boom, you're back in business. In more intense situations, mastering the reload movements can pay tremendous dividends. This is true for the shotgun as well. Press a button to open the chamber, load two shells at a time from your backpack, flick it back, and you're ready to go. It feels awesome, and readying the shotgun in time to blow through a combine soldier as he's closing in on you is one hell of a power trip. The SMG doesn't have any cool tricks to it, but you can only load a cell after the last one is completely drained. This means strategically choosing when to fire the rest of your rounds in that cell. Although the pistol isn't very powerful, landing headshots will still grant enemies a swift death, and that's where the true brilliance of Half-Life Alex's combat becomes apparent. Much like the previous games in the series, it's simple, yet it feels great. It's not easy to land consecutive headshots on Combine Soldiers in a 3D space, especially as the beefy boys are introduced, but that's what makes it feel so gratifying to take them down. And pistol ammo is abundant throughout the game. Of course, this is probably done in order to assist you in taking down zombies and headcrabs as they're easy prey and it would be a pain to waste it all. But I feel this is done to prioritize the pistol throughout the game, which in turn improves your accuracy and resourcefulness. Then, when you need to switch over to the shotgun or SMG, you can mow through enemies. It's funny because I stopped using the pistol toward the end of Half-Life and to an extent Half-Life 2. So this is the exact opposite philosophy, and that's the power of a focused weapon selection. Valve experimented more with accuracy with armored headcrabs and their weak spots, but the true genius comes to light when fighting antlions. When you shoot off both legs, their abdomen becomes exposed. Landing one clean shot with the pistol is enough to kill them. This would be easy if the antlions didn't swarm you, or they didn't pair them with a faction of combine troops all over a train yard. Once again, a simple idea, yet brilliant in execution. But the antlions mutate. These blue antlions can spit at you and completely drain your health in the blink of an eye. The trade-off though? They have the potential to die in one clean shot to their glowy abdomen. Look for your opening, and BOOM! This is what makes combat feel so good. It rewards accuracy with conservation of your resources, allowing you to spend SMG ammo to speed up a battle with antlions, or use a couple of close blasts on a soldier from your shotgun. It took me a while to realize just what it was that I loved about Half-Life Alex's combat. Yes, streamlining mechanics is always a good thing, especially for VR shooters. Yes, it feels good to use the right weapon at the right time. But above all else, emphasizing accuracy and making the player feel good about themselves for landing their shots, thus rewarding them with a higher ammo count, in a game where aiming is more complicated than simply clicking on heads, was pretty smart. That's just one of the many reasons this game benefits from being built for virtual reality. The only exception to this rule would be the lightning dog enemies, as dealing critical damage is more important than accuracy if you want to keep the fight moving. Actually, that's why these ended up being my least favorite enemies, is when a lightning dog reanimates a corpse, you have to wait for its predictable lightning attacks to end before you can deal any more damage. I'm fine with scouring a room for these little guys, but the lightning dog zombies kinda suck. But I digress. The weapons are great, and the combat feels nice. But how do they compensate for the limited selection? Relying on these three weapons without changing things up would get a little stale after all. Well, each weapon is upgradable at a combine fabricator with resin, which is scattered all over the place. At first I was iffy on the idea of an upgrade system in a Half-Life game. It was always better at progressively accustoming the player to new weapons as enemies became tougher, right? Of course, that philosophy still exists in this game. The big combine chonkers are only introduced after you acquire the shotgun, for example. But isn't that type of progression enough for Half-Life? Well, with such a limited selection of weapons and Half-Life Alex's comparatively confined levels due to VR movement, Resin ended up playing an essential part in keeping the game engaging. In order to fully upgrade your guns, it'll cost you about 300 resin. There will be enough resin just lying around for the average player to acquire the upgrades they might want, but in order to really pimp out your weapons and have choice, you'll need to scour the surrounding environments. Searching drawers, moving debris, sifting through every nook and cranny. It lets you directly interact with the game's detailed physics engine, with objects functioning how you'd expect them to. Although the levels have been partially constrained, that doesn't limit the designers on how they allow the player to explore them. That's what makes them work. 
But what are these upgrades, and how do you benefit from using them? Well, the cheapest upgrades are reflex sights for the pistol and SMG, and a laser sight for the shotgun, but more expensive options have a bigger effect on gameplay. Each gun has their own version of an extended magazine. With the pistol, you can load bullets into a separate chamber that acts as a reserve. Considering the small mag size of the pistol, this can be useful in emergency situations when you're being overwhelmed. You can also get a burst fire mod, and a laser sight that makes pointing at heads much easier. The shotgun gets an autoloader to speed up the reload process, as well as a grenade launcher. You load it onto the front and watch it fly. By storing backup grenades in your wrist pockets, you can essentially turn into Demo Man. Yeah, although I went on at length about the pistol's importance, you can assume any playstyle you like as long as you're smart with your ammo and you use your resin wisely. And in that regard, resin was a great way of sneaking a modern mechanic into a Half-Life game. It works beautifully. When exploring, you're not limited to resin, either. You can also unearth some ammo caches, just like Half-Life 2. You can find grubs for use with a corresponding first aid dispenser, which is a great teaching tool for exploration and memorization. Using your multi-tool and completing an unlock puzzle could reward you with health syringes and grenades as well, which you can store in your wrist pockets. I love these things. You can shoot with one hand and arm a grenade in the other this way. Rather than having a million different pockets across your body like in Boneworks, you reach over your shoulder for ammo, and you can see what's in your wrist pockets at all times while your weapon wheel is mapped to your non-dominant hand's thumbstick. You hold the button down and you move your hand in the direction of the gun you want. This becomes second nature and it feels great. The rest of the information you need can be viewed on your left hand. Your health, your resin count, and the ammo count for the gun you currently have equipped. The amount of ammo in your current weapon magazine or chamber is all visible on the gun itself. It's great. I know I got sidetracked there, but I really love how this game handles HUD information. But yeah, let's, let's step back for a second and give this video some structure. Another key part of Half-Life's design is its ability to blend puzzle solving with everything else. And thanks to VR, a whole new paradigm for designing puzzles has opened up. Aside from general pathfinding stuff or locating a missing item or battery akin to stuff you'd do in Half-Life already, the majority of puzzles stem from the multi-tool. Sometimes you'll need to disable a force field or power some machinery. To do this, you'll have to rewire circuitry. This means fumbling around a section of a level and seeing how the wires link up. I think they're great tests of spatial awareness, especially with ones that have you wrapping around a much bigger space, climbing on top of things, or sifting through debris that could be blocking your view. They do overstay their welcome a tiny bit, but they're nothing in comparison to these cache puzzles. Although the idea in place is excellent when dealing with puzzles in a 3D space, rotating the orb and moving the corresponding dots together and whatnot, they litter these so frequently throughout the game. Because finding the locked cache wasn't its own reward as a result of the game's level design, for some reason, this was the extra step they felt was necessary. While they do get more challenging as the game progresses, they don't change things up. The real winners in puzzle design are standalone. Early in the game, you'll notice a swarm of floating debris that forms an eye. The Vortigaunts are trying to lead you towards their hideout, but before that, they need to make sure that you're worthy. To do this, you'll need to collect some information from the surrounding area. The Vorts have drawn all over the surrounding walls, recounting the events of Half-Life 1. You'll see some glowing debris inside a cage, and upon release it floats up into a seemingly inconsequential form, until you look at it from a certain angle and realize it's centered on the combination for the crane. This was a brilliant puzzle. I also really enjoyed getting the train tracks operational by rotating these things for a laser to cross through, and then scrambling to switch tracks before the train crashes and kills everyone on board, as well as the room filled with explosives and trip mines that you have to carefully defuse. A callback to the spatial awareness and platforming required in that one section from the original Half-Life. I would have loved to see more puzzles of this level of ingenuity, as well as physically involving myself in problem solving. But Valve hasn't reached their full potential in that regard. We'll talk more about this toward the end of the video, but Valve has a lot of room to improve, and that prospect is exciting. Now on the flip side, let's talk about when the game's best elements come together. A lot of Half-Life Alex's most enthralling moments come from virtual reality. Physically pointing a flashlight to navigate a dark area as toxic headcrabs jump from every direction, and zombies begin to take you by surprise, that shit is immersive, scary, and can only be executed this well in VR. But it's only scratching the surface of what this game is capable of. There is one chapter in this game that sticks out to me as one of Half-Life's finest, and that's 20 years worth of competition, and it's simply known as Jeff. My analysis of this chapter might feel a bit dry, but it's important that I take you on this journey with me. At the beginning of this chapter, you'll find yourself exploring an old distillery. After getting blackout drunk, you'll meet a creature that this guy, named Larry, calls Jeff. Although his movements can be manipulated through sound, as demonstrated by Larry, one wrong move could leave you melted like this poor little headcrab. 
The first section of this chapter focuses on this valve in the center. If you try to rotate it, Jeff will hear it and he'll maul you to death. You need to figure out a way to open the elevator door without having Jeff on your ass. To the side of the room, there's a dark cellar with resin for you to collect. Now Jeff has an ear like Mozart, as Larry put it. He can hear everything. He can even hear you coughing if you forget to cover your mouth while walking through spores. Getting trapped in that cellar with Jeff by accidentally making noise would suck, right? Well, that's where I had the idea to lock him in there. I threw a bottle in the cellar and locked the door behind him. From there, I rushed into the elevator, but the power went out. While following the circuit, he bust out of the cellar. Of course. But since you have to get in there to complete the puzzle, you need to draw him away from you. While redirecting the circuit, I accidentally made a siren go off and Jeff closed in on the cellar. My worst nightmare. I had to frantically search for a bottle and throw it over his head before he could find me. Often in horror games, I find scenarios scariest when your hand is forced. When the game pushes you to do something that you really don't want to do. This, paired with the moment in which you share an elevator with Jeff, scared the living crap out of me. I also get freaked out when there are situations beyond my control, like this headcrab sabotaging me as I escape from Jeff. What an asshole! Doesn't it know what Jeff can do to headcrabs? The next section requires you to locate three batteries. You can come out and revisit this beautiful sunset whenever you like, and it's a nice way to decompress after getting up close and personal with Jeff. I should mention that while you're looking for these batteries, you'll have the opportunity to collect some more resin, and Valve knew you'd attempt to grab it all, so they decided to mess with you a little bit. Grabbing this resin off the top shelf could result in bottles crashing down, and if you think you're safe just opening a few drawers, you're not. Right here, a bottle nearly rolled out onto the floor, but I caught it just in time. I adore this moment right here, it's so smart. You're taking a calculated risk when interacting with anything in this chapter, as Zen Fauna could make noise when trying to grab a battery, or you could make too much of a racket trying to get this valve in its proper place. Once you get all three batteries though, you trap Jeff in a trash compactor and you're out of there. Gabe Newell once mentioned wanting Half-Life to scare the player again, and although it took him a decade to realize that vision, the team managed to do it. Jeff is a terrifying chapter that has you completely shift your playstyle and step out of your comfort zone, and I don't think I'll ever forget how it made me feel the first time I experienced it. The only downside? The chapter doesn't have anything in the way of combat to test you on. But don't worry, there is another chapter for that, and it'll push you to the limit. The penultimate chapter of Half-Life Alex, actually. Do you remember how it felt to take down a Strider in Half-Life 2? Those towering behemoths that could shred through your HEV suit in a matter of seconds if you weren't careful? Wouldn't it be crazy to witness that thing towering over you in VR? Yeah, it would be. Well, too bad. This one's down for the count. A Strider! Deactivated though. Whew, lucky break there. Could you imagine that thing blocking your way? Oh man, rise. Don't jinx me. So you just go about repairing the elevator with nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. It's actually pretty boring. Alex, a Strider! Look out, it's alive! Escaping this thing means ducking, bobbing, and weaving, finding anything to use as cover. But even in this scenario, the Combine doesn't let up. They throw everything at you, and I found myself scrambling for syringes and grenades while desperately conserving my ammo and landing headshots. There isn't much cover, and they relentlessly flesh you out. Clearing them out will take some true skill and thought. After avoiding the Strider for a bit longer, you'll take control of a giant turret and finally tear it down. Man, that fight felt good, and I'm glad they held off for so long on introducing the Strider. God, just a lot of what makes this game such a refined VR game works in tandem with what makes it a great Half-Life game, which in turn demonstrates why VR was such a great fit for Half-Life all along. Although the team is filled with new blood this time, as it has been 13 years, they've paid respect to the series' strong and timeless conventions. With that said, I have one question left to ask. Did they pay respect to the series' lingering narrative, the one-of-a-kind atmosphere of the world, and the emotional attachment millions of people have to it all. Let's rewind all the way back to the beginning. Half-Life Alex was originally written solely by Sean Veneman, but as the game got further, they brought Eric Wolpaw and Jay Pinkerton on, who were part of the mass exodus from Valve across 2016 and 2017. Eric had experience writing the episodes for Half-Life 2, and Jay is responsible for a lot of Portal 2's sense of humor. The three of them had to live up to a lot, but Half-Life Alex's setting allowed for them to ease people back into this narrative without worrying about the ramifications of an immediate follow-up. At first, Alex needs to rescue her dad, after he's captured by the Combine and sent to Nova Prospect. But it eventually becomes a race towards the Floating Vault, which contains a super weapon that could benefit the Resistance if stolen. This Floating Vault is this game's Citadel. 
It's always there, and the sheer scale becomes apparent the closer you get to it. Virtual reality is one hell of a drug. Along the way, Alex is made aware of Eli's impending doom, and I am positive that it became the motivation for us all to move forward. There are a plethora of fantastic set pieces that work beautifully in VR, like sticking your hands up after the Combine holds you at gunpoint, discovering a Combine advisor on the crash train, or reaching for Eli's hand only for him to fall down. I live for stuff like this. It makes me feel like I'm really filling Alex Vance's shoes, even if it might seem gimmicky. The world itself comes alive with that trademark level of detail to be expected from Valve. Like Half-Life 2, characters will meet your eyeline when talking with you, even though their animations are mocap this time. There are always insights into the world of Half-Life lying around, such as this magazine with Dr. Breen on the cover. Douche. I have no idea who mocapped the Vortigaunts, but they did an excellent job conveying their mannerisms and movements. I'd like to think that it was the Vort's actor Tony Todd, just becoming a Vortigaunt. Speaking of voice acting, unfortunately Merle Dandridge does not play Alex in this game. She's instead played by, oh god, I'm gonna butcher this name, <laughs> Ozioma Akaga. Valve wanted to go for a younger sounding Alex. Even though Merle's voice hasn't really changed since Half-Life 2. Some decisions were inevitable, of course. Actor Robert Guillaume passed away in 2017, so James Moses Black was cast as Eli here. If Breen were to come back, they'd have to recast him as well. Alex's recast was a conscious choice, and after listening to it for a while now, I'm a huge fan of her take on the character. Even though she had no prior knowledge of the character and she wanted to avoid hearing Merle's performances, Alex's mannerisms and delivery felt completely intact. Even the sound of her voice felt similar to Merle's, at least to me it did. I may never agree with the decision to recast Merle, but Ozioma did a fantastic job playing Alex here. The writers also gave her some convincing material to work with. A game revolving around her gives Alex time to grow, and she does here. Although it seemed like Alex was a hardened badass in Half-Life 2, we still got a glimpse of fear out of her in a scene in Episode 1. That dose of reality exists within this game, as she reacts to the various circumstances, and a lot of it comes out as she bounces off of Russell. Throughout the game, Alex is accompanied by this dashing newcomer to the series. He's played by Reese Darby, of whom I am a huge fan. Much like Steven Merchant in Portal 2, I imagine they gave Reese free reign to ad-lib, resulting in a character that I grew attached to. He just feels so down-to-earth and goofy, and I can't get enough of hearing from him. It's a shame he probably won't ever come back for a future Half-Life game. The reason? Well, I'll save that for later. Your adventure through City 17 is shaped by Mike Morrisky's soundtrack. At first, I was disappointed to hear that Kelly Bailey wouldn't be returning for Alex, but Mike at least consulted with him while composing for the game. And he got it right. The atmospheric tracks still carry unsettling and unusual instrumentation akin to what Kelly Bailey accomplished, and the combat music still pays respect to the hard drums, low guitars, and harsh synths of old. <laughs> Synths are especially symbolic of Combine technology, and they become a motif as you approach the vault and especially as you fight the Strider. Ever since Portal 2, Mike has used stems in his soundtracks at Valve, building upon a song as it ramps up in intensity. To show you what I mean, here's how it sounds when the chase begins. combine bust in and you start shooting, the synths go ham. With all that said, Mike knew when to keep the game silent, just as Kelly did. The philosophy and atmosphere of Half-Life's music remains intact, but it evolves on what Kelly was doing in Episode 2 and creates an intense and enriched soundtrack that I highly respect. My favorite song, however, well, that comes from the game's credits. And before we get there, we should talk about the ending. After overhearing a Resistance member conferring with the Combine, Eli comes to the conclusion that the vault was built as if it were a prison, in order to keep something in. The only thing that could bring them down. Eli realizes what, or rather who, they've kept prisoner. Survived Black Mesa, then disappeared. Eli, they do have a super weapon. God damn it, Russ, they got Gordon Freeman. This revelation was a pretty big deal, but it almost seemed too good to be true, and it wouldn't line up with the series' narrative. I loved theorizing about what that vault contained throughout the game, and my anticipation was only growing as time went on. 
I entered the vault and started playing what could be the only chapter to rival Jeff. Point Extraction. See what they did there? This absolutely mind-bending chapter plays with perspective, platforming, and allows the player to experiment with low-gravity physics as much as they like. And I loved finding my way through this section. The music is all inverted violins, and yet it has harmony. Multiple sections feel like they were ripped out of an Aishar painting. I loved working my way through it and I didn't want it to end. And rather than using some kind of final boss, the game gives you a power fantasy. You see these green balls of energy? These are your weapons, and they one-shot any enemy they hit. You can imagine what ensues. I'm throwing balls of death and grenades all over the place watching the Combine fly. After a scrap with a Strider and countless Combine soldiers, this is cathartic and makes you feel like an unstoppable badass. I am not kidding when I say this and Jeff, as chapters, could have sold me on a VR headset alone. They're that good. Of course I owned a VR headset before this game came out, but, you know, hypothetically. Anyway, it's time to put an end to this speculation. You open the prison and, really, who else would it be at the end of a Half-Life game? The G-Man alludes to the flow of time being flexible, as he walks around and toys with your senses, catching you off guard. What would you want, Nudge? Miss Vance? The Combine off Earth. I want the Combine off Earth. Uh, that would be a considerably large nudge. Too large, given the interests of my end. Well, you asked. What if I could offer you something you don't know you want? Here we go. As soon as I heard Dark Interval, I knew where this was going. The G-Man shows Alex the moment she watches Eli die and says she's proved herself useful up to this point, so he allows her to save his life. Yes, you actually get to save Eli, completely undoing a plot thread we've been waiting 13 years to see resolved. It's more complicated than that though, just hang in there for me. Gordon has escaped the G-Man's grasp thanks to the Vortigaunts, consistently avoiding manipulation, and Alex has always been of interest to the G-Man, so as she proves herself to be capable in this game, he places her in stasis leaving the first Half-Life game in 13 years on yet another cliffhanger. Of course, this is common for Half-Life. Every single game in the series ends with a cliffhanger of some sort. But from what I knew, after so many years of nothing, this was what I was getting. And at first, I was angry that this was the note I was left on. I sat through the credits completely brokenhearted. But as I sat there and thought to myself, I figured, wait. They wouldn't leave things there. They had a reason for doing this, and I just wasn't seeing it. The tone of the ending clouded my judgement, and I needed hope for the future. The music seemed to be building up to that hope. And, lo and behold, I hear a familiar voice. Warning. Vital signs. Critical seek. Medical attention. Gordon! Gordon! Wake up, Gordon. She's gone, Gordon. She's gone. Son of a bitch, it has unforeseen consequences. I knew it. When I get my hands on him, I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna figure this out. Right now. When I experienced this for the first time, I wanted to scream in excitement. After years of silence on the continuing adventures of Gordon Freeman, I had something to hold on to. Literally, I had something tangible to hold on to. With this post credit scene, and being able to grab that crowbar, my entire outlook on the future of the series shifted from bleak nothingness to HOLY SHIT OH MY GOD HOLY SHIT But let's calm down for a second. There's a lot here that just doesn't make sense at first glance. I know a lot of you have already had time to think about this ending, and it's possible that we all could be overthinking things, but surely what G-Man is doing would have caused confusion amongst the Half-Life timeline, right? And didn't Mark Laidlaw skirt around the Borealis' potential to time travel by having Gordon and Alex destroy the damn thing in Epistle 3? What are they doing here? Well, here's my interpretation of events. 
After Eli is killed, G-Man was disappointed with Gordon's inability to keep him alive. The reason G-Man asked Alex to relay his message to Eli was because he was supposed to live in the first place, and face those consequences, rather than die out. To set these events in motion, G-Man travels back in time and allows himself to become captured by the Combine, anticipating Alex's ability to free him. She does, and from there, he allows her to save Eli. Proud of the work she's done, he places her in stasis. This respects Mark's ideas for episode 3, as she was to be placed in stasis there too, while Gordon would be left in the dust. Now the reason I believe this doesn't create a paradox is because we are witnessing a split timeline of events, and that split occurred as soon as G-Man interrupted the flow of time. In one timeline, Gordon and Alex set off for the Arctic in search of the Borealis. In the other, this happens. This pays respect to the closure we received in the form of Epistle 3, allowing fan projects like Project Borealis and Boreal Aleph to continue, but it also allows them to write themselves out of the corner they were stuck in for years. Valve knew that Mark Laidlaw released his letter, and instead of creating something that attempts to resolve the cliffhanger and render his work obsolete, they created something new, something that works contextually, and they left the future of the series open. Truthfully, the technicality of it all is something that I believe the writers wanted us to discuss for years, just as we discuss the mystery behind the G-Man. My theory is but one of many that people will come up with. This ending, in the face of the entire Half-Life series, has a far greater meaning than what is presented at face value. It's aware of Laidlaw's letter and the temporary closure we received, and for the first time in years, it gave me hope for the future of Half-Life. But what is the future of Half-Life? Half-Life Alex may have been a great launch for a VR game, but it's clear that its sales were truncated by a small install base. More people watched the game on Twitch or YouTube than the people that actually played it, and that was inevitable. I have no doubt that Valve will continue to release VR games that improve on concepts introduced here, but what about Half-Life? Alex may have been fantastic, but it isn't perfect. I wanted more breadth in its locales that weren't derivative of Half-Life 2. The zoo, hotel, and the game's final chapter all felt unique enough, but I've seen train yards, garages, and sewers before. I want the puzzles to have a similar amount of breadth, so that the pacing remains consistent and things don't get repetitive. I want to see them attempt more weapons. Melee weapons and other objects have already caused problems for them according to Robin Walker, so it's okay if they stick to adding more guns. But, with that said, no melee weapons means no crowbar, and that means a VR-based sequel starring Gordon Freeman is unlikely to happen. But does this mean Valve will tackle another keyboard and mouse Half-Life game? It's exciting to think about, really, because there are so many directions they could take, but there are also countless things that could still be accomplished within Half-Life Alex's gameplay. And I'm sure modders will be creating compelling maps and campaigns for years to come, as the workshop tools for Alex are on the horizon. By the time you're watching this video, they might be out, since they're on SteamDB right now. And even then, the modding community is so great that they've already developed their own tools, and they've created some decent maps with them. Someone even created a horde mode for the game, and I loved it. If all that was possible with bootleg tools, imagine what Valve's tools will enable people to create. With that said, if the next official installment in the Half-Life series takes a long time, I'm willing to wait. I'll wait as long as I have to. I know that's the exact opposite of how I felt in my Half-Life retrospective, but this game was damn good, and I have hope for Valve's Silver Age. Needless to say, they've proven me wrong. It's impossible for me to predict the future. Although I am certain AAA VR games will finally start coming out of the woodwork, including but not limited to Respawn Entertainment's Medal of Honor game, I have no way of knowing how this will impact the video game industry as a whole. Perhaps VR games will always remain niche, supplementing traditional games. But what does feel like common sense to me is Valve has to really buckle down and work on some more VR games. They don't want to hang the current VR player base out to dry, so they have to get serious about game development again. This is the direction Valve is taking. It might not be what everyone was hoping for, but Half-Life Alex convinced me that this was a necessary step for them, and I can't wait to see what they come up with. Here's the thing. I had 20 years of hindsight with my Half-Life retrospective. I have far less than that with Half-Life Alex. It's impossible for me to say what happens next. Right now, I want to live in the moment. Valve is back, and I have hope for them. More than I've had since Portal 2. It's easy to pick on them for the questionable decisions they've made, and I'm still bitter about the scars they've left on me for going dark. I definitely won't forget what they've done. But I can forgive them for it all. These 13 years have been a bumpy ride, but if it meant getting a game as good as Half-Life Alex, I'm certain it was worth it. I'm also certain that it'll age well. A game that is refined, immersive, and fun, 
a game that did similar things for the medium of video games that its predecessors did, will hold up for years to come. I don't doubt its ideas will be built upon and that better games will come out soon, but I have a feeling I'll be coming back to it for a long time, just like its older siblings. Its combat is impeccably satisfying and based on skill, its level design may be confined but it's exceptionally detailed, its upgrade system is intelligent and strategic, it's immersive, it's scary, it's intense, and it's emotionally gratifying. I love this game, and yes, it's worth buying a VR headset for in my honest opinion. Even if you spoiled this game for yourself, it's still worth playing. With virtual reality, watching and playing are even further removed from each other than with flat screen games. You really won't understand until you play it for yourself. If you can't afford it, there's no rush. The game will still be there when you have the chance to play it. Half-Life didn't turn to dust after all these years, and there are people playing it for the first time today. A couple of years ago, I watched my brother witness Eli's death for the first time. It's never too late to experience a groundbreaking video game. Don't push yourself, just wait. I promise it'll be worth it. I mean, we've waited 13 years with no hope to hold on to. What's a little longer, right? And Valve, thank you. I missed you. Welcome back. I'm so glad they put the gnome in the pistol tutorial. This is for making me suffer in episode 2, you jerk! Wait a second. What's this achievement for? Gnome vault of my own. Bring a garden gnome with you to the vault. Motherfucker!